my brothers and sisters in Christ, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers here. And I just want to share with you some very exciting news. This fall, I'm going back on pilgrimage. Father Thomas Reagan and I will be leading the Footsteps of Paul pilgrimage to Greece from October 20th through the 31st with a special extension to Rome from October 31st to November 3rd. Uh, all the information, you go to my website, deaconharold.com and click on the pilgrimage link and you will get all the information for all the pilgrimages I have coming up. But for this one, uh, we're going to be doing 13 days in Greece. I'm so excited to be traveling again after being sidelined for so long because of the COVID-19 pandemic. All the information is right here. You can see the pricing for the pilgrimage and what the pilgrimage includes. It's going to be a wonderful time, especially now. You know, uh, as we're walking through the uh, Acts of the Apostles to actually be in the places where Paul taught and walked and, and uh, preached the gospel to, to those first Christians. And so uh, I'm inviting you to join us again. The Pilgrimage to Greece, all the information is right here. All you have to do is go to my website, uh, deaconharold.com, and just click here on Pilgrimages, and you can see... Um, my pilgrimage page right here with uh, information about um, and my personal invitation inviting you to travel with me on pilgrimage, as well as an article of what it's like to travel with me on pilgrimage, some great photos, an interview uh, with my uh, pilgrimage coordinator, Ellen Holmes Steve LeBlanc, about the contemplative pilgrimage experience. And right here, you can see all the pilgrimages that I have coming up, including the one uh, to Greece with Father Thomas Reagan. And all you got to do is just click on this button to sign up right here. I look forward to being back on pilgrimage with you, and I hope you're able to join us. Until then, please be assured of my prayers, my friends. Take care, and may God bless you always. Welcome to Deacon Harold Burke Sivers' Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar, where Deacon Harold and guests explore our Catholic faith through passionate discussion. Get ready as Deacon Harold and his diverse guests bring an array of knowledge and life to Catholic teaching. You are watching Deacon Harold Burke Sivers Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar. All right, well first of all I want to uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, I, I joked about it a little bit after the homily, but, but seriously, it's, uh, this whole COVID thing has been very difficult for a lot of people, not just for myself. Um, and quite frankly, to be completely honest, I mean, I've had my struggles as well. You know, when things were going well, when I was traveling around the world, 200,000 miles a year, you know, things were going good, I was in a rhythm, I was in a routine, I was praying, I was working out, I was doing all these things. And all of a sudden, literally, literally, stop. Just like that. Stop. For 10 months. So, I mean, I've had my struggle. I've put on my 30 pounds. I've had struggles with my marriage. There's some things that came up um, since I was home all the time. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, you know, so, and I work, you know, we're, we're working through some issues. Um, you know, so I just want to make sure that we're still praying for all the people that make their living by traveling, but also for all of the people who are struggling with this. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about business owners, restaurant workers, um, teachers who have to do everything online when they're not really interacting with their students, nurses, doctors, people on the front line, moms, dads. Grandparents who are in assisted living facilities that cannot see their loved ones. So there's a lot of trials during this time. So I just want to make sure that we're remembering and praying for all the people during this, uh, this time of uh, pandemic. So why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to do that? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning, because death and sin was not part of God's plan. That's not how God started to do So let's go back. We got your Bibles. Just open up. We have to go too far. Just open the page one. <laughs> and on page one of the Bible, we 
see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, let's we'll, we'll stop there. Then God said, Isn't that interesting? God speaks to us. Now, this said, this spoken word that comes forth from the mouth of God would become who in the fullness of time? Jesus, how many of us do that making it up? John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And verse 14, and the Word was made and dwelt among us. So God the Father speaks the word, and it says, let us. Now last time I counted, how many gods are there? One. So what's this us business, let us? The Trinity. All right, so we got God the Father speaking the word, Where's the Holy Spirit? See, here's the thing about verse 26, Holy Spirit. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So God the Father speaks the word through the Spirit, and everything comes into being and existence. If anybody asks you what a Trinity is in Scripture, Page one. Then God said, let us make man. Oh, here we go. Here. You know, I get sick and tired of this foolish political correctness. We go around in the mass in our faith, neutering God. God is a father. But we, we, we want to take out man. We want to take out, look, the word man here in Hebrew is Adam. Adam has a sense of the fullness of humanity. There are two different words in Hebrew for male and female, each and each child. Adam has a sense of humanity in its fullness. How do you know that's true and not make it up? He created. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So out of the fullness, we have God, each and each child, male and female, equal in dignity before God right from the beginning. Equal, but not the same. See? One of the things the lie the culture says, in order to be equal, you have to be the same. Garbage! That's a lie of the culture. <laughs> Equal, let, let me give you an example. Um, let me borrow somebody's wife. Uh, or, <laughs> how about you? What's your name? You're not married? No matter who on. What's your name? You don't want to go? Oh, who wants to have a little fun? Just, let's take like two minutes. Come on up. I put my mask on so I don't get sick or whatever. So. What's your name? Nicole. Nicole? All right. Nicole, we're in love. <laughs> and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, the day you've been waiting for is here. So I get down on my knee and I took out the box, which is my rosary box. <laughs> and inside that box is a ring. And mounted on that ring is an ostrich feather. Okay, now, let me ask you a question. What, it, uh, does 10, 10 pounds of diamonds and 10 pounds of ostrich feathers, how many people think they're the same? 10 pounds of diamonds or 10 pounds of ostrich feathers, are they the same? Oh, let's just see about that. So I, I get down, I walk over in, right? There's an awesome friend. What do you say to that? Thank you. <laughs> you guys are 
before God. Now, what? So God meant to be great to rescue the Lord out of nothing, out of overflow of his divine love, he creates man and woman. The very first thing that God does, about verse 28 now, and God blessed them. What is God doing there? Participate. 
and his ability to give new life. That means the conjugal act is sacred and it's holy because it comes from that noticing order. Covenant first, sex second. Because it comes out of, because love always comes before life. Psalm 119, verse 88. Because of your love, O oh Lord, give me life, and I will do your will. Because of your love, give me life. Life is always an outflow of love. And so here, he says his first, so his first word, uh, in fact, the word here in Hebrew um, for, uh, is, is uh, fruitful is ebrata, ebrata. Right? You heard that, you heard that word Jesus used in the New Testament? I mean, ebrata means to be open. So, gee, God's first words to our first parents is be open to life. First words to our first parents. Be open, ebrata, be open to life. But what have we done in our culture? We've taken this sacred gift, gift and we've twisted it and distorted it and converted it and changed it into a consumer product. You know, in this country, we spend $3,000 every second on pornography. $3,000 every second turning women into whores for our pleasure and gratification. And by the way, pornography fuels human trafficking. I was in law enforcement for 23 years and police chief for 11 years. And I can tell you that human, that pornography fuels human trafficking. But oh, it's just wrong. It's not hurting anybody to try to justify our sense of behavior. Hmm. Let's see what else God has to say. Now we turn our attention to Genesis 2, the second creation narrative. Genesis 2, and here's one of my favorite lines of the Bible. Genesis 2, 7. Now this is a different creation. So some people say, well, they contradict each other. No, they don't. It's telling the same story from a different perspective. So here in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord formed man of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I love this line. First of all, it says, the Lord formed man, Adam, of dust of the ground. So the word for dirt, dust, or soil in Hebrew is Adama. Do you see the term of the word? The Adam comes from the Adama. So man comes from the dirt. Adam from the Adama. Huh? How do we remember this in a very beautiful, powerful way as Catholics every year? Ask Wednesday. It's a couple days from now, remember? Remember that you are, and to Adama, you shall return. Beautiful. But here's my favorite one. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Nishmat, ruach, ka'im in Hebrew. Beautiful phrasing for God taking the very breath of his divine life and pouring that life into us. In fact, in, in, in the Septuagint, the Greek word there is, a, is a, what we think of, uh, called aberration, being mouth to mouth with God. That's what aberration means. Literally, the etymology is to be mouth to mouth with someone who's aberration, to be mouth to mouth with God. He breathed into us the breath of life. We have the power of God's life giving spirit flowing in us and through us right now. Do we live our lives as if that even matters? Do we even care? Then, now, okay, now, okay, in the beginning, this one, man is depicted as a male. Okay, don't worry, ladies, belief is coming. But here it says, put man in the garden to till and to keep it. So when you read that in English, you think, oh, he made him in the garden. Isn't that swell? That's not what's going on here. The word for till in Hebrew is abah. It's a word that's in the form of service. And to keep is the Hebrew word shamar, which means to protect and defend. So what is the Lord doing? He puts the man in the garden, he 
gives him his mission, his calling, his vocation to serve, protect, and defend everything that is being entrusted to him. God's given him his purpose. Men, that's what we're called to all men, are called by God to serve, protect, and defend. I want you to remember that. Okay? We're going to come back to this. Remember that. Serve, protect, and defend. Now, in the garden life, he says, you don't need no Ten Commandments. There is only one. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of the you shall not eat, for they of you and you shall die. Now, what's the deal with the tree? <laughs> he puts the dude in the garden, says, all of this is yours, but then puts a restriction on it. Oh, except for that tree right there. Why? Why do with all the authority and put a limit on it? In other words, what is the purpose of the tree? Two reasons. One, the tree is a physical reminder of God's authority. You know how sometimes we get, I'm the president, I'm the vice president, I'm the DRE, I'm, I'm in charge! And we get so caught up in our own ego that we forget who's really in charge. So the tree is a physical reminder to the man, yes, you have, I give you authority, but remember, I'm God, and you are not. The second reason. Now, it's not just any tree, is it? It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a couple different words for knowledge in Hebrew. One is the af. The af is factual knowledge. Two plus two is four. It's raining outside. That's factual knowledge. But that's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is yada. Yada is knowledge that is gained by experience. You have to experience something in order to know that thing. So for example, Psalm 46 verse 11 says, Be still and know that I am God. Same word is used there. Yada. So you can translate that, be still and experience God. So let me give you an example of what they mean by knowledge by experience. Um, I have four beautiful children, including a set of twins. Now, the twins are 18 now. <laughs> but when they were about four, they wanted to cook dinner one night. They wanted to help me cook dinner one night. So I'm at the stove, they push their stools up on either side, they climb up on the stools. So I'm like, okay, safety check. So I look over here, here's Sophia, next to the cutting board prep table. And here's my son, Benjamin. And Benjamin is near the stove, near the fire. So I said, Benjamin, watch that. Yeah. Irene? No. 
make it. Because if you study Roman crucifixion, not only did they want to maximize the pain, they wanted to maximize the embarrassment. They wanted to strip you of every ounce of dignity that you had while you were suffering the most excruciating death there was at that time. But we put the one part for our Lord, obviously. But sometimes you see it girded like someone in God. What's he found on that cross? Sin and death. And so what does he say? He says, this is interesting, because women didn't fight back then. She girds her loins with strength and makes her arms strong. <laughs> the woman's a warrior. I don't ever want to hear anyone say a woman is weak, because that's not what the word of God says in Genesis 4 and Proverbs. Now, footnote. Every once in a while, I throw in a footnote. There is a reference in Peter where he says the woman is the weaker sex. You remember that, okay? Context, context, context. He's writing to a group of people who are pagans, who are coming into the church, who are used to treating their women like garbage. He's saying you can't do that anymore. And the word they use for weak is asteneo. Asteneo, we bring it up. It's a word they use for a support that has a crack in it, like a support column, like one of these columns holding up the church has a crack. It's not falling over, but it's weakening. What he says is, your, your job as a man is to serve, protect, and defend, because a woman is physically weaker than you, so you don't beat on her, you don't treat her like garbage. Your job is to serve, protect, and defend, both physically and her dignity as a woman. That's the context. So don't let anybody twist you up. See, the Bible says women well, be good enough. I'm going to blow your minds for a few minutes here. Let me get through this first. So, we, so how does he go about creating this woman? This battle partner, this assassin He puts the dude to sleep. The dude wakes up. Oh, looks over.
Jesus, he took his side and created her. But a Jewish person hearing Shema would have met up the middle. But if we say side, what do we mean? Upper side, lower side, left side, right side, side of Christ? What are you talking about? So it says he took his side. Now, why is that so important for us as Catholics? Take a look at our Lord on the cross. Now remember, Jesus always referred to death as sleep. You ever notice that? He refers to death as sleep. Remember Lazarus? When Lazarus died, let us go to wake our brother. When the 12 year old, 12 -year -old girl died, one of the two places where Jesus quoted in Aramaic, which is the language that he spoke, Talitakum, the two girl arrives. Because remember when he said, so she's dead, he goes, oh no, she ain't dead, she's asleep. And they were like, what are you, what? We're not sleeping, we know what death looks like. Remember, he kicked everybody out, except for the parents of Peter, James, and John. They woke up and said, give her something to eat. Our Lord is in the care of their mom. The pair of the sleep of death on the cross. And Long Jonas spears him through his right side. You see the spear mark. He speared him, and what came out? Blood and water. Blood and water. Blood and water for the Eucharist. And we'll talk about tomorrow why the deacon takes a drop of water and drops it in the chalice. The blood and water flowing from the side of the That's one meeting. We'll talk about the other meeting tomorrow. But also, the church fathers talk about blood for the Eucharist, work for the baptism. The church is born from the side of Christ. The bride comes forth from the side of the bridegroom. Because when Jesus wakes up from that stream on Easter Sunday, something amazing happens and goes from the dead. Therefore, a man and his father, mother, and peace to his wife, and they become one flesh. Not 
one person. So many times people love, oh, I'm so in love. I lost myself in him. I lost myself in him. I'd be like, you better find yourself. <laughs> when, when you're in a relationship of covenant love and intimacy, you don't lose anything of the individual person that God created you to be. You don't lose yourself. You find yourself. Because your spouse helps you to become more of the person who God created you to be. In fact, what do we say to say to adultery? She brings out the even the sacred culture recognizes that fact. And your spouse helps you to become more of the person who God created you to be. And in one flesh, huh? So remember, this is Genesis, there's no Jesus, there's no sacrifice, no nothing. But the deepest form of intimacy is what? The Eucharist. Where we take our Lord and unite his body to our, the two become one flesh. So here, obviously, we're not talking about the Eucharist, obviously, but the conjugal act is a one flesh act of communion. What does that mean? Sacred and holy. And a man is by from naked and not ashamed. They're seeing each other's bodies and they're not ashamed because they're seeing each other through God's eyes. They're looking at each other the way God looks at them. Bam! That's God's plan. So we spent 40 minutes talking about two pages of the Bible. The Bible could have been the shortest book in the history of the world. But we got all the rest of this, which is what? How we messed it up, how Jesus had to come save us. That's all the rest of the Bible is. Now the problem is what happened? Everything's great. Who shows up now? Mm -hmm. the, by the way, the serpent, in Hebrew, the word there is Nahash. Nahash. And Nahash literally means monster. See, we have this idea of the snake being that little garden serpent, because that's what many of are. When they're depicting the scripture stories, remember, people couldn't read. That's why we have stained glass windows in the church. It told the stories that they were hearing the message people can't read. There were no books. So that's how they told the stories to Mark and to pictures. So they were thinking this is a no, no, no. This was a monster. Now, what does the monster go after? Not the rocks, not the trees, not the orcas, not the spotted owls. What does he go after first? No, 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 that's who? What is he going after first? The family! A direct attack on family life. Now, you can't tell me Look around our culture today that almost every single attack in our culture is attack against the family. Satan is still at it. Now who in the family does he attack first? The woman. Why her? Careful. Don't say she's weaker than him. We talked about this already. Here's why. See, we have this thing where people say that Catholics don't think very much of women because we won't let them become priests or deacons. See, the church is not fair. So let's stop. Let me, let me think for a second. So in order to be the woman who God created you, you have to do a menu? Women aren't priests because priests are fathers! Fathers! She's created after the man. She's created second. Oh no, she's 
not created second, she's created last. Notice in Genesis 1, we can go through the details of time. All the animals, the male and not second, last. What about the man? Again, we can go through the whole narrative of time. Genesis 2, the man, then we skip the part, all the animals, and then the woman on his side. Not second, last. God saved his best work for last. And I, no, so I'm, not, I'm dead serious. She is the cherry on top of the whipped cream, on top of the ice cream of God's creation. Why? Because a woman has a special intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Every Sunday, including today, we pray the Creed. Pray on Espiritu Santo, Domino, at VVV content. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and give her up. A woman shares in that life-giving power of Almighty God. Even if she never has a child, she's a nun. By the very nature of how God created her, she is a wife giver and a life bearer. God saved the one who gives life last. That's why Satan attacks her first. Why? He's the author of death. And so he has to go after the one that gives life. See, even sometimes in Mass, right? The, the, the text says brothers and sisters. But out of this political friends and sisters in front of you're demeaning women when you put them first. Because I just showed you, God made them last, but he saved his best for last. But we've got this twist, we have to put the women first because the church is allowed. That's garbage. Get that out of your minds right now. Very clear from the word of God. Now, what does he say to her? He asked her a question. Now, God's first word to us was, at that time, be open to life. What is his first word to question? Verse, Genesis 3, verse 2. Did God say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Girl, is that what he told you? Now, why does he ask that question? Why does he ask that question to her? Me, myself, and I. 
That's what the cost of worship. And in fact, so many young people, they're looking for God. But they tell you, I don't have to go to church to find Jesus. I don't need sacraments. I don't need the Eucharist. I don't need confession. I just have to be a good person found out there. Well, first of all, Jesus never says that. Nor does it just be good and you'll get to heaven. Doesn't say that anywhere right here. And the second is they're, they're still putting themselves under your bar. You know who they're just learning out here? CNN, MSNBC, Fox, yeah, whatever, whatever network, that's their God. That's the ocean of that they're worshiping at. So when they say, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, no, no, no. It's the very things that they think are making them free, they become enslaved to. Jesus came to undo that thinking. Now what happens? Now she was back in the tree. Now she saw the tree was good for food. Sin is going to taste good. She saw it was a light to the eyes. Sin looks good. It was time to make one wise. I'm going to be like God. So she took all one verse out, verse, verse 6. She took of his fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, and he ate. Period. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both were open. A couple things to notice here. First of all, it's not her fault. Some people say, see, it's the woman's fault that's in here. Look, she was, uh, uh, Couple of things. First of all, notice, she ate, but verse 7, the eyes of both were open. It wasn't until they both ate that they both fell. Why? They were one flesh. So it wasn't like she ate, then she fell, then she tempted her husband. Baby, come here. Look what I got for you. Huh? I already took the bite. Now it's time to think, oh, no, that's not what the word of God says. She ate, he ate, then they both felt because they were one. Now hold on now. Now bring it back. When Satan was all up on his wife, where was her husband? Where was he? Was he out playing golf? <laughs> what was he doing? He was there. How do we know? Because the word of God doesn't say he was standing there. Ooh, this is where learning the original language can really help. For example, if I were to say, hey, you, who am I talking to? Oh, really? I could be talking to you, or I could be talking to you. Huh? It's the context, right? That's in English. In other languages, they have two different verbs for the two U's. In, like, for example, Spanish, if I say two, two is you. If I say vosotros, that's you, all y'all. Same thing in Hebrew. If you look at the Hebrew, it says, when the devil says you will not die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes are open, you will be like God, plural. He's talking to both of them. That means what? They were both there. Now remember, what was his job? Serve, protect, and defend. Now was his time to do that. He stood there and said and did nothing. While Satan destroyed his family. He said and did nothing. We got too many men standing around doing nothing. You can, you can tell me, like last last week in the Super Bowl, I literally, literally did not know who was playing the Super Bowl until the day before the Super Bowl. And the only reason I knew that is I was in an airport and saw it on TV. Some of you guys can tell me every play, every score, every touchdown, but you cannot tell me why you come to church on Sunday. And you wonder why your kids leave the church. Serve, protect, and defend. Strong men, strong families. Strong families, strong church. Strong church, we save the culture. But 
but he failed, and sin and death came into the world. The worst effect of sin is death. You cut yourself off from God's life. Now, God tried multiple times to establish covenants with his people to restore them to life, but it didn't work. It didn't take hold. It didn't stick. Breaking, breaking, over and over and over and over again. So finally, finally, Jesus had to send his son. Now we heard my mommy today, you heard the first reading that described someone who had leprosy and what the priest was supposed to do. Then I did my mommy with the prescription, male unblemished lamb. That was why, see, Jesus was the offering, the obvious day. We told the people God to only the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, but he's also the priest. He's the perfect priest and the perfect victim. There is no greater offering God can give us than his son. Because what are the relatives we have? Lamb, sheep, goat, oxen, turtle doves. But now we have the Lamb of God. The priest, the Levitical priest, offered the sacrifice on behalf of God. Now God himself comes to offer the sacrifice himself. There's no, that's why Jesus said it's the new and eternal covenant. Perfect sacrifice. And by conquering death, he so that not even death is more powerful than God's love. Not even death is more powerful than God's mercy. And that's what we inherit as sons and daughters of God the Father. We follow the footsteps of his son, we conquer death. See, some people think our journey to life is here. Uh -uh. Here on earth, we are on pilgrimage. How many of you have been on a pilgrimage? Not many people have been on pilgrimages? Ooh, gotta go. Amazing. But we're on pilgrimage. pilgrims. This is not our home. Where's our home? Heaven. That's the end of our journey, not here. Here we're just pilgrims on earth, journeying toward our heavenly home. Jesus came to make sure we get there. So now let's talk about sin. Now when the church talks about sin, it talks about mortal sin and venial sin. And sometimes we get criticized, don't we? We say, you Catholics like to put things in categories. The Bible says all wrongdoing is sin. And you guys are this kind of sin and that kind of sin. Oh, where do we get our teaching on moral and venial sin? Council Nicaea 325, Constantinople 381, Ephesus 431, Chalcedon 481, Council of Trent 1545. Anybody know where we get our teaching on moral and venial sin? From the Bible! Open your Bibles to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 16. 1 John, so by the way, they're video in this. You can go back and look at these scriptures later. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, mortal sin, the same word, some your translations may say deadly, some translations mortal, it's the same word in Greek. What is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God will give him life, for those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. I do not say what is to pray for that. Violation of 
one of the Ten Commandments. That's the benchmark. So if it's a uh, grave matter sin done with full knowledge and deliberate consent of the will, I know what I'm doing is wrong and I freely choose to do it anyway. You lose sanctifying grace because grace will be to get to heaven. If you die in a state of unrepented mortal sin, you are going to hell. In fact, the Catechism says, upon death, the soul descends immediately to hell. So I'm sorry for being so soft. <laughs> That's why Jesus came. He didn't want anybody to go down. But I guarantee you, there are people sitting in this church right now that if you left this church were hit by a bus, you're going to hell. Because you ain't been in confession in a long time. Now, let me tell you about why you have to go to a priest to have that sin committed. Now, a lot of you have seen my EWTN, right? I've been on every year since 2005. I have nine television series on EWTN. Stretching from 2005 to this year. But a lot of you probably don't know, I also did some television work for almost a year on TVN. You know, the Trinity Broadcast Network, the Protestants? You know, praise the Lord, that whole thing? I said, what are you doing on there? They called me. They heard me on Catholic Answers, and they called me up and said, uh, can you come and help us with a few? I said, you know I'm Catholic, right? They said, oh yeah, we know. I said, oh no, you don't know. <laughs> I'm like big C Pope Catholic. Like, we know. Okay. So I got permission from my bishop, which you have in Canada law. You have to get permission to do something like that, so I did. And you know, I, I have to say this. I truly admire and respect how much our Protestant brothers and sisters love the Word of God. Because they truly do. They truly, and I learned a lot from them. <laughs> and they sure enough learned a lot from me. <laughs> now most of the guys, we would sit down and we'd have to back and forth over Eucharist and notices and this and that and purgatory and all sort of stuff. But there were a couple of guys who didn't like the fact that they invited a Catholic to be there. So one of the guys wanted to challenge me. He said, you're not Catholic deacon, yes, Pastor. And you believe you have to go to a man to have your sins forgiven? Well, not any man, but, but the priest. He said, you don't have to go in some dark box to confess your sins to a man. All you got to do is pray to Jesus. And the blood of the Lamb comes to Jesus. And the blood of the Lamb washes away your sins to Jesus. So I let him finish. And I said to him, how do you know for sure that your sin is forgiven? He said, what? I said, did I stutter? How do you know for sure that when you pray to Jesus each and every time your sin is forgiven? Because if that's the case, then what incentive do I have to do anything good? Think about it. I, Jesus said, feed the hungry and drink the thirsty, clothe the naked, bless the poor. What if I don't do anything Jesus said? Because what it sounds to me like what you're saying is, if I look at porn, if I cheat on my wife, if I steal for my employer, all I have to do is just pray to Jesus and then boom, is it every time? If it's that, is, is it that easy to get to heaven? They looked at me. All you have to do is pray to Jesus and the blood of man covers you and you get convicted in your heart. The Holy Spirit fills you. I said, blah, 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 time, blah, time out. A feeling in your heart. You're basing the forgiveness of sins on how you feel. How do you know that's not acid reflux? <laughs> I, I, said, I said, think about it like this. Say, me and you are friends. And before I leave, we get to an argument so big, we're no longer speaking to each other. So I go home, my wife says, how do you know? Wait, wait, this in the past, we're no longer talking to each other. A month goes by, my wife says, I'm just thinking about it. You ever reconcile with the pastor? And I said to my wife, I just know I'm a heart. That the pastor and I have been Do I know for sure that our relationship is healed, yes or no? No, I don't. What has to happen? I have to have an encounter with him. I have to 
to see him again, talk to him again, email, Skype, face, FaceTime, something. There has to be some communication between us to know for sure that the rift between us has been healed. God sent great prophets. He sent great men and women of the Bible. And finally, he sent his son. Finally, sent his son to get the message across to us. So I said, Pastor, gee, God wanted, he no longer wanted to be a God that was far off, away from us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why? He wanted to touch us with his own hands. He wanted to love us with his own heart. So he became one of us. He said, Pastor, show me a verse in the Bible where Jesus, who is God, out of his mouth says, pray to me and your sins are forgiven. So the scriptura. You want to believe the scripture alone? Okay. Show me the scriptura where Jesus says, pray to me and your sins are forgiven. Because then I'll believe you. Show me the verse. So he starts flipping to the back of the Bible. I said, I don't know what you're looking for back there. I don't see Peter on the cross of my sins. I don't see Paul or James or John on the cross of my sins. I see Jesus. I ask you to tell me where Jesus says, pray to me and your sins are forgiven. Now here's where I think he was going. He never showed me this verse. Later after the word, what's he going? Here's where I think he was going. First John chapter, chapter 1, uh, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. All that verse says is one of the major components of the forgiveness of sin is the confession of the sin. It doesn't say how the sin is forgiven. All it says is in order for your sins to be forgiven, you have to confess the sin. That's all that verse is saying. Oh, who wrote this? John. Let's see what else John has to say. So I told the pastor, open your Bible to John's Gospel. I said, you can see the Bible you got there, the one the seven books missing. He said, but you got this one. John chapter 20, verse 19. Now, John chapter 20, 19. The apostles of the upper room after the crucifixion. This is the evening of the resurrection. The evening of the resurrection. Only ten apostles are there. Why only ten? Judas hung himself. And we know the first time that Thomas wasn't there. So there's ten apostles. Jesus comes in. Like I said in my homily, he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I sent you. And when he said this, he breathed on them. Why, why does John include that detail about breathing? It's very important. The word for create in Hebrew is bara. The only one that creates anything in the entire Bible is who? God. By the way, we don't create anything. We are co-creators with God. We don't create. God creates through us. Hmm? That's how it works. So, so we don't create, God creates. So he says about the breathing. Now, there's only two places.
He breathed that Holy Spirit who sins you forgive are forgiven. He gives them his power and authority to forgive sins in his name. That's what Jesus says out of his own mouth. Why didn't Jesus, I said, why didn't Jesus just say, look, fellas, peace be with you. If anybody has sinned, you tell them just to pray to me. I'll take care of it. He didn't do that. Instead, he gave them the Holy Spirit and empowered them to forgive sins in his name. Why, I asked him, did God do it that way? Why did he make it easy to do what you said he did? Just pray to me. Why did God do it that way? He said, I'm not sure. I said, okay. What religion were all those gods? Jews. Well, in the Jewish mind, who's the only person that can forgive sin? God. So when they wanted their sins to give what did they do? They offered sacrifice. So I said, well, we're going to do Leviticus chapter 5. So Leviticus chapter 5, the first four verses is just a laundry list of a whole bunch of sins. Then in verse 5 it says this, when a man is guilty of any of these, sins in verses 1 through 4, he shall confess the sin he has committed. So hold on. The Old Testament and the New Testament agree with each other. John said in 1 John chapter 1 that in order for the sin to be free, we have to confess the sin. And it also says here in Leviticus, in order to have the sin forgiven, you have to confess the sin. But that's not all. Keep reading. And, duh, he shall bring a guilt offering to the Lord for the sin committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat. Why a female? Now we know from the Passover and for other major sins, it was the male unblemished lamb. But for regular sins, why was it a female of the, of the um, sheep and the goats? Oh, you got this put together. From what I said before, she gives life. Sin kills you, kills the life of God in you. So you slaughter the animal that gives life to try to restore life that you lost through your sin. See, it makes sense. And that's why they use animals. Because we're not pagans. They use their virgins. Right? I mean, they had the same thing in the pagans. Except they said, oh, we'll just sacrifice our virgins. We'll sacrifice our children. Uh, no. They asked why they use the female average to go. Hold on now. And the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. Who? Who? I thought only God can forgive sins. He does. Through the priest. I said, Pastor, that was the only verse. You might have an argument. Let's keep reading. <laughs> now, some people would say the Holy Family was destitute. They were dirt poor. That is not true. And I'll show you why right now. That is not true. There were three types of offerings. For the wealthy, for the middle lower class, and then for the dirt poor. And we'll see that breakdown right now. If you cannot afford a lamb, then you shall bring us your guilt offering to the Lord for the sin which has committed two turtle doves or young pigeons. That was the offering the only family made. If they cannot afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he shall bring forth as his offering for the city has committed a tenth of an epaph of fine flour. An epaph is 1.9 gallons of dry grain. One tenth of that is called an omer. So if you couldn't make the sacrifice you bring, you bring the, 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 the omer of wheat and the, the priest takes it says, the priest takes a handful of it as his memorial portion. We're going to break that over tomorrow night. That, the idea of memorial, that's why Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He doesn't say, do, you do this in remember me. Critically important why Jesus used those words, but we'll come back to this tomorrow. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him for the sin he has committed. In any of these things, if he shall be forgiven. Who? Pastor, those are the only two verses. And I went on and on and on and showed him every place where it says when they wanted to be forgiven, they went to the priest. Now Jesus also said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So Jesus 
for bread. He is the Lamb of God who offered at the Last Supper bread and wine. Who else offered bread and wine in Genesis chapter 14? Melchizedek, the King of Righteousness, uh, of, of prefigurement of Christ, who is the ultimate King of Righteousness, the Lamb of God, who offered bread and wine as his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So we no longer have to bring a lamb or a sheep. What do we bring now before the Lord when we confess our sins? What do we bring now? Ourselves! Our brokenness, our hatred, our lust, our illicit desires. We bring everything that separates us from God's love and we bring it to the priest. Now when the priest hears your confession, does the priest then say, Jesus absolves you in the name of the Father? So that's what the priest says, right? Jesus absolves you? Some of you are going like this. I mean, you ain't been in confession in a long time. <laughs> the priest says, I absolve you. Whoa, 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 whoa. How dare he say that? How dare the priest say that? The only way a priest can say that is if Jesus himself gave that priest authority to forgive sins in his name. Oh yeah, John 20. So when we hear the words of the priest, we're hearing the words of Jesus, who still, to this day, wants to touch us with his own hands, who wants to love us with his own heart. And he does that through the so I said, Pastor, when we hear those words, Jesus himself gave us the guarantee that the slate is wiped clean. The sins are gone. We can start again. That's the guarantee that we can be 100% sure that the sin is forgiven. And that's how we roll in the Catholic Church. And he closed his Bible and went away. But another guy came back. So I guess word spread. And they tried enough to talk about tomorrow. Because if another guy tried to talk to get me on the mask, so talk about that tomorrow. But here's the point Jesus gave this incredible sacrament. Now I want to end with this. If you're still having hang ups about going to the sacrament of reconciliation, Couple, just want to go one. Well, I'm not going to tell, go through the steps of how to go to confession. But I just want to say this: sometimes Catholics don't want to go, 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 want to go to confession because we confuse guilt with shame. Okay, guilt is when you do something wrong and your conscience convinces you, "Oh, what you just did was wrong." That means your conscience is working properly. It's telling you you did wrong, and that's a good thing. Shame is when somebody else finds out what you did. Now you feel shame. The problem is we think by going to the priest, oh no, Father's going to notice me. He's going to notice me. I don't want to confess that to Father. He's going to think bad of me. He's going to think, that's me. We don't want to confess. It's embarrassing. That has, nothing, that has nothing to do with it. See, the priest, I, mean, I talk to the priest all the time. I believe they receive a charism at ordination. When they don't remember. They're not in there like, who is that Marge? Is that Daniel? <laughs> Come on, they're not doing that. How do you think I feel? I was going to, true story, a couple years ago, I was going through TSA, Oklahoma City. I'm going through the next ray machine. TSA, officer, he's got the other side. Are you on TV? Well, the kind of TV I'm on, I don't think you know about that. She goes, oh no, are you home with that nun? I'm like, get out of here. I'm like, how could you possibly know about this? She goes, oh, my mom watches that channel all the time. And I remember I was at the house, and no matter, she has that channel on 24-7. No matter what part of the house you're in, you always hear that channel. And one time I heard this voice. And I said, what, I said, what kind of creature is that? 
So I looked in the shoe. <laughs> Can I have a picture for my mom? So I'm taking a selfie with the TSA officer. What? Just by my first I, You know, I, I think every time I go to first, I think the people say, okay, thank you. That's how you don't just leave Come on. Don't worry about that. The priest is there to dispense the mercy of Almighty God. He don't care who you are. He doesn't care about your voice. He care, what he cares about is giving you God's mercy and forgiveness. That's why he's there. Don't be afraid to go if you've been for a while. It's okay. God loves you more than you'll ever know. God's love for you, our love for each other is like a drop in the ocean compared to the depth of love that God has for each and every one of us. As if you're the only person that's ever been created. If you're not convinced of that, I will end with this last example. There are two friends working together in an office, in cubicles. One of the friends from North Burbank. He said, you know what? I want to have a parish mission. Let this start now. I want to witness to my co-workers about my faith. I don't want to be a parish mission in my faith anymore. So he finds out that the guy that you will next to him is a fall away captain. Here's my chance. So he goes to the guy. Excuse me. Yeah. I I work next to you. You go over here. Hey, um, I'm captain. And I heard that you used to be captain. Guess what? I've been going to New Mass at a church down the street here, and I'd love to invite you. I'm 
done wrong in my life. All the sins I've committed against your holy name. Uh, which one was the worst? So Jesus steps back like a movie screen. Slide after slide of his unrepentant mortal sins. The last slide is Jesus' broken, bloody body from the Passion of the Christ movie. And he turns and says, your sins put me there. He disappears. Now the friend saw what happened to his buddy from the queue. Now it's his turn. Thank you for watching Deacon Harold's Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar. Tune in next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for more. Thank you.